The front has been breached! The cry rang through the streets and out into the night. The cathedral bell kept up its insistent toll, and from the houses beyond the medieval walls, families rushed with their children and elderly parents through the gates. In five minutes, the gates would be closed and locked against the advancing army, as they had been time and again in centuries past. It would do little good. Modern weapons would make quick work of the old stone walls. There would be no going to Marie Babineau's cottage. There would be no going anywhere. A familiar, hot and cold sensation flushed across Minnie's skin. She clenched her jaw. No, no. This wouldn't do at all. Come with me, Minnie said to Bisclavre, and strode off toward the brew house. She had to retrieve the rest of her kit. Bisclavre, looking a bit dazed, followed her, his limp more pronounced as he tried to keep up with her long, even stride. Where will the townspeople be sheltering? she asked, pausing briefly to let a panicked family run past them on the street. Bisclavre watched them go, and it must have occurred to him that he should be following them, not her. Minnie put a hand on his shoulder to stop him. Monsieur, please, I need your help. Tell me where the people will be sheltering. The rumbling of artillery had been replaced by a storm of gunfire. Somewhere beyond their little valley, Minnie could hear more village church bells ringing, spreading the warning up and down the mountain chain. The cathedral, and, and basements in some of the other buildings. Minnie renewed her march toward the brew house, watching Bisclavre closely to ensure he was following. Does this town have any defenses? A volunteer militia, uh, but there aren't that many in its ranks. Other than that, no. He seemed to be regaining his focus. We were trying to put a charm on the surrounding woods to deflect searching eyes, but we couldn't find the right alignment of trees to make it work. Minnie nodded, her mind racing ahead. They'd reached the brew house. Its door was open. The barkeep was ushering people down into his cellar, while a couple of old-timers remained at the bar, drinking calmly in the face of invasion. Minnie heard one of them begin belting out a song in German as she and Bisclavre hit the stairs. The picture Bisclavre was painting wasn't a pretty one. This village had little to protect it. At this rate, it would be swept under the German tide in no time. While the Germans didn't necessarily destroy every town they went through, in this mad dash to the firebreak, they weren't likely to be gentle. In case they failed to puncture the firebreak, they'd want bases here in the mountains they could retreat to and hold. Minnie shouldered her quiver and haversack, tipped her helmet onto her head, and grabbed her bow. She didn't have time to waste. She couldn't be pinned down here. As a knight of the order, a German occupation of the city probably wouldn't prevent her from leaving but her special status wouldn't protect her from the indiscriminate horrors of stray bullets or buildings collapsing on top of her. Fully equipped, she turned to Bisclavre. Is there any other way in or out from the city once the gates are closed? No. Not that I know about anyway. His eyebrows drew together. You want to get out? Minnie began down the stairs. He followed. I still have a mission. Halfway out the door, the cathedral bell stopped ringing. In the distance, the peal of smaller church bells still echoed, mingling with the sounds of war growing ever closer. Before them, the streets of Sanctuaire à la Grotte were mostly empty, aside from the occasional straggler making their way to wherever they chose to shelter. The gates are closed now. Bisclavry stared down the street, a stricken expression on his face. We should head to the cathedral. No, Minnie wouldn't accept defeat yet. She racked her brain for a plan, any plan. Well, now was as good a time as any, she supposed. Monsieur, you wouldn't happen to know what a matigo is, would you? Bisclavre glanced over at her, surprised. I, I would. Colette told us about them. They were a creature known to inhabit the south of France, though they're not often talked about. Minnie turned to fully face him. Can you summon one? He stepped backward, wincing as he put weight on his injured leg. You cannot wish me to do that. Why not? Matagos, they're... well, they're tricky devils. As far from harmless as an adder in hand. I see. Can you do it? Bisclavre's mouth moved soundlessly as he gaped at her. After a moment, he took a deep breath, resolve replacing his previous distress. I can. But 
Only if you agree to take me with you if you do find a way to leave. That seemed reasonable enough, though depending on how they escaped, having a tag-along might be a serious impediment. Either way, it was a moot point. She was not in a position to bargain. She ignored the twinge of fear that raced from her head to toes, remembering the fate of two of the other men she had tried to lead to safety, Cresswell and Sultan, both mowed down by German firepower as they tried to flee from trenches overrun by ghouls. Done. Bisclavry spat on his hand and held it out. Minnie hesitated. Sometimes a handshake was just a handshake, but sealed with spit or blood and bolstered by will, it could become a much deeper bond. It wasn't that she intended on breaking her promise to take him with her. She just didn't like the idea of being magically compelled to do anything. From what she'd gleaned from overheard conversations among more experienced knights, the Order found such dealings dubiously ethical. The magic animating them tended to lack nuance and could backfire on both parties. Still, Bisclavre waited, showing no sign of budging until she complied, and from the look on his face, he wasn't interested in entertaining any counter-proposals. So she spat on her hand and grasped his. A jolt jumped from his palm to hers, making the hair on the back of her arm stand up. May your feet grow heavy and root you to the ground if you break your word. Bisclavre shook her hand once and released it. Minnie swayed on her feet, inexplicably dizzy. Oh, this wasn't good. She had underestimated Bisclavre. He had passed himself off as a mousy, bookish man with a mostly academic interest in magic. As her vision stopped spinning, she suspected she'd been duped. He might be all those things, but he was also a formidable practitioner in his own right. Come, he said, turning to stride back up the street toward his shop and the apartment tucked above it. We've preparations to make, and not a lot of time to make them. They picked their way through the darkened streets toward the cemetery adjoining the cathedral. Bisclavre with a pack on his back and a sack dangling down beside him, many following with his lantern in hand. In the dips between the mountain peaks, arcs of magnesium flares could be seen streaking across the black sky. I was planning on cooking this for supper, but it seems fate had other plans. Bisclavre walked under the arch of the cemetery gateway. It isn't an ideal offering, but it will do in a pinch, God willing. An ephemeral mist drifted up from the ancient, lichen-crusted markers as they passed between them. Along the stone wall surrounding the cemetery stood the only trees that remained in the medieval quarter, each thick-trunked and heavy-canopied. Behind the cathedral, the castle ruin poked above the forest, its blocky bulk awash in the waxing moonlight. Bisclavre followed her gaze. The village started fortifying it but it's not in good enough condition for the women and children to shelter there. It hasn't been maintained through the years like the cathedral. Some of the militia should be making their way up there now, though. Minnie nodded. Her ankle was aching again, and between her pact with Beast Clavre and the looming threat of the encroaching enemy, she was not in a talkative mood. They passed under tangled arms of tall yews. Beast Clavre stopped in a markerless gap between two gnarled trunks. This should do. He sat down in the grass. Minnie followed suit, placing the lantern beside her. Its light cast their shadows long and low across the ground and onto the bottom stones of the graveyard's north wall. Bisclavre untied the knot in the sack and pulled out a freshly plucked roasting chicken. He set it on the grass between them, then reached over to a small stand of enterprising bearded grass and ripped up a fistful of stems. Carefully, he began laying them end to end around the chicken. It would have been better to offer a live chicken to a medigo. This should still attract one, though. Does the ritual take long? Beast Clavre shrugged. It'll take as long as it takes. I've never summoned a medigo before. He closed his eyes, pressed the backs of his hands together in front of his chest, and began muttering something she couldn't understand. Occasionally, he would make arcane gestures with his hands, touching different fingers together or flicking his wrists. Minnie watched him closely for the first five minutes before her attention wandered. 
She found herself angling her right ear toward the front behind her, trying to gauge how much time they might have left before the Germans swept this valley. From the cathedral steps, she could hear the disembodied voices of villagers. One was clearly a frightened child. And then, from the corner of her eye, she caught a strange motion that had nothing to do with Bisclavre. Her head whipped around, searching for the source of the unaccounted-for movement, tension threading tight between her shoulders. Bisclavre continued his summoning ritual at the same intentional pace. Another twitch of movement, and Minnie realized that it was coming from above. She looked up. The twisted branches of the yews, already serpentine in their shape, were moving, undulating above their heads, the shadows between them darker and deeper than any Minnie had ever seen or dreamed. Her throat tightened, her lungs seized, a horrible foreboding pressing down on her. In a panic, she scrambled away from the trees, their horrible, reaching arms in that impenetrable darkness through which the eons gazed, so complete it might have been a glimpse of the void before the birth of light. Before she could truly clear the reach of the trees, however, they fell still, and moonlight reappeared between their leaves. Minnie paused, her palms digging into the soft, wet earth beneath her. Once she was sure the only stirring of the trees was thanks to the wind, she hazarded a glance at Bisclavre. His eyes were open, his hands folded in his lap. He was looking around himself. On the grass in front of him, the raw chicken remained untouched. Did it... did it work? Bisclavre's brows drew together. I thought it did. It should have, but... A sound interrupted them, softer than the crackle of artillery in the next valley over. A rustling. Minnie cocked her right ear to it, trying to zero in on its source. The hedges lining the cemetery walls, she decided, catching another rustle. Her shoulders drooped. Probably nothing more than a nocturnal critter they had disturbed, or perhaps attracted with the smell of raw chicken. But Bisclavre was looking in the same direction, and he had not relaxed. The lines of his shoulders had tightened. Something about his posture made him look poised for action, either to bolt or... What exactly? Attack? The lantern flame guttered, and goose flesh rippled across Minnie's skin in a prickling wave. Ah, fresh meat. Minnie started, the voice so clear and immediate she glanced around her. She found nothing but moonlight, wet grass, and gravestones. The rustling picked up. Then a creature issued forth from the hedges directly across from Minnie on a hiss of wind. Its body formed first, coalescing from the shadows between the hedge leaves, then a slender leg extended into the ring of lantern light. Two glowing eyes caught and reflected the flickering flame trapped behind its glass and steel. Bisclavre motioned with his hand for her to return to the ritual ring, and quickly. For you, he said solemnly, we offer this sacrifice in exchange for your service. Minnie carefully made her way back to her original position across from Bisclavre, eyeing the Madigo warily as she did. Its form hadn't quite settled, somehow blurred around the edges, until Minnie briefly looked down as she settled herself. When she flicked her gaze back to the Madigo, she inhaled sharply. A black cat had taken its place, or rather, it had become a black cat. It sat on its haunches, eyeing the chicken with a twitching tail. She had the impulse to laugh, for it really seemed somehow so funny that this creature would inspire so much fear and caution. But she stifled the urge especially once she noticed how its cat's fur swallowed the lantern light and moonlight alike, making it an impossible black, almost the same darkness Minnie had seen between the yews. Hmm, a single favor? Minnie startled again at the nearness of the voice and its queer, shifting quality. The Madigo's mouth had not moved, but its shape had moved, its fur vibrating and arising falling wave with the words. 
Its eyes flicked to hers, and she flinched. Even as she forced her eyes open again, determined not to show this creature weakness, she felt it smiling, though again nothing on its feline face suggested anything of the sort. No, Minnie interjected. I would ask for your service for longer than that. It lashed its tail. It It will cost you. Yes, the first bite of every meal shall be yours, as is custom. Bisclave shot Minnie a sharp, cautioning look. It should be sacrifice enough, especially in these times when one never quite knows when their next meal will come. Will that suffice? The Matigo studied Minnie. She kept her back ramrod straight, and her own gaze level and direct, even if the prickling across her skin had returned and was intensifying with every passing second. I, so so long long as as the sacrifice sacrifice is commensurate to to the deed... Finally, it turned its attention to the milky white flesh of the chicken. Well, let Let us test the quality of your... offering. Bisclavre gave a terse nod, and Minnie leaned forward, drawing her dagger to cut a wing from the chicken. He had instructed her on this part as he packed his belongings back at the apartment above his bookstore, as well as the general rules governing pacts made with a matigo. Carefully, she resheathed her dagger and held the wing out to the creature. It blinked languorously, and with silken movements soft as shadow, it rose and approached. After a brief inspection of the meat consisting of a sniff test and a single lick with a surprisingly pink little tongue, it sank its teeth into the wing and pulled it from her hand. She watched with sick fascination as it consumed it by simply swallowing it, bones and all. It shouldn't have been possible, given that the wing was the size of the Madigo's head by itself, but somehow it just consumed it. And even though Minnie was watching it, trying to see exactly how it was able to do such, her eyes didn't register any distortion, any stretch or strain of proportion as it did so. And then she blinked, and the whole chicken was gone, and the booming over the ridge seemed louder. When she glanced away from the matigo, now licking one midnight paw, Bisclavre was looking similarly confused. "'Twas an acceptable meal, I suppose. Now then, what is it you wish of me, my dear Minerva?" "'I didn't tell you my name,' she said automatically. It paused from its cleaning and narrowed its golden eyes at her. "'Didn't you?' She swallowed, her mouth unaccountably dry, her tongue rough as sandpaper. What the hell? As she took a swig from the canteen clip to her haversack, she tried to think about what, exactly, she needed to ask. Bisclavre had stressed it was important to be clear about what she wanted. It was hard to think, though, hearing the sounds of war suddenly so much louder, and the renewed crying of a frightened child. A few cracks of distant small arms fire joined the mix, peppered between with the steady progression of mortars. We're in the middle of a war and soon to be surrounded by enemies. We need a way to get out of the city. I I see. see. Have Have you you tried tried the the gate? gate? Minnie's careful deference melted before the flat glare she laid on the matigo. Again, she got the impression that it was smiling, but not in a friendly way. The gate is closed. We need a new way out. Some way that will get us safely out of the city without leaving any openings for the enemy. The Matigo left off its cat-like cleaning and stretched. Define safely. Minnie pursed her lips. Some way that doesn't end in us blown full of holes or dead in a ditch. A way that will circumvent the enemy and see that we make it out of the city alive, there to part ways and make our own fate. Bisclavre translated, pinching the bridge of his nose. The matigo seemed to give the problem some thought. Its eyes narrowed as the stretch traveled from its back to its front. There is a way. It straightened with a yawn and a flick of its tail, though it isn't without its risks. As long as those risks are manageable, we'll accept them. Minnie pushed herself to her feet as well. Bisclavre followed, swaying a bit on his aching leg and readjusting the weight of his pack on his back. Then follow me. The voice came from behind her. Minnie whirled to see the matigo already trotting through the gravestones. 
She and Beast Clavre exchanged a glance, one that instantly communicated that neither of them was at all sure about this, and, in Beast Clavre's case, that he had told her so, but it was too late to go back now. I would suggest you hurry if you wish to stay ahead of your enemies. They're not long from your proverbial door. With reluctance, they followed. When they reached the entrance of the graveyard, the Matigo turned toward the cathedral and made for its entrance. Minnie grimaced as she passed under the grotesque gargoyles leering down at them from their alcoves and spouts. They looked especially horrid under the erratic flash and burn of enemy artillery. As Minnie and Beast Clavre neared the cathedral doors, they slowed. Under the shelter of its massive stone archway, townspeople huddled, oblivious to anything but the ridge beyond the walls. Their stares were fixed on the east, where streaks of magnesium rounds and bright pops of burning red light could be seen further up the slope, followed immediately by the clap of explosions. A young boy yelped at a particularly loud boom that covered his ears but he didn't seem able to close his eyes, nor take them from the latest evidence of his impending doom. They remained frozen wide, the comets of war shooting across the night sky reflected in the terror glazing them. Minnie halted, her chest tightening. This was wrong. It was all wrong. She couldn't let this happen. Not if there was a way to stop it. Not if she had the power to do something. Matigo, wait. The cat-like creature, about to dart between the legs of an elderly couple holding each other in a grim embrace, paused. Yes, Minerva. She tossed an uneasy glance across the townspeople, worried they might look at her strangely for talking to a cat, but none of them were paying her any mind at all. It was unsettling how they silently stood vigil. Then again, Minnie wasn't sure she could stand sitting inside the cathedral, waiting blindly for the first mortar to strike. If she were in their shoes, she would probably be right there with them. The Matigo sat down and watched her with bright yellow eyes. Minnie firmed her jaw. Is there a way we can help these people? Beast Clavre shot her a surprised look. The Matigo blinked lazily. There are many ways. For instance, you might kill them all now and save them the pain of what is to come. But I doubt you meant that. You'll have to be more specific with me, girl. She met Beast Clavre's gaze. You said you were trying to find a way to protect the village. We've a spell to thicken the trees or some such. Could we do that? Beast Clavre shook his head. I, I, I don't know. No, the Matigo answered. Such magic is beyond your ken, and would cost more than both of you could afford to make that from naught. Minnie closed her eyes, her throat tightening. She couldn't save them. Just like it had been in the trenches, she just had to take who she could, and hope they made it to the other side. Fortunately for you, you don't need to work something new. She opened her eyes again, the tightness loosening a bit. What do you mean? The Matigo swished its tail. There is old magic here. Old and potent. Broken. Sleeping. But not beyond repair. Mend it, and you may save this village yet. Relieved, Minnie felt her face suddenly split into a smile. Beside her, Beast Clavre remained sedate. Wary, even. Excellent. Do we have time before... Yes, there is time. But you forget Minerva. Everything has a price. It may be one you are unwilling to pay.